Hi, welcome to Bad Music Taste, another ways to ruin your life. My name is Dominic. And my name is Sam. Dominic has a record this week. This week's record is self-titled by Rice of Spring. This record was first released in 1985, and the copy I have here is a repress on black vinyl. But anyways, today we're talking to Johnny Temple of Girls Against Boys, Kashik Books, and Fake Names. How's it going, Johnny? It's going great, and I'm thrilled to see that I'm in a podcast with that Rites of Spring album, one of the best <laughs> rock albums ever recorded. Johnny yeah, I, uh, every night we watch Jeopardy, but then one night I was I was away and my parents sent me this picture. It was like Right to Spring is credited with uh, being the first band of this genre. It's like this is the one day that I miss when there's, a, <laughs> when there's the Rights of Spring question. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, that was yeah. amazing. But uh, Fake Names just released an EP. So how was it recording this over the pandemic? It was odd. Um, uh you know, we were all, not, I don't think any of us were ever in the same room at the same time to either write the song or to record it. So everything was done fully remotely. We do have a friend, a very good friend, a DC musician friend named Jeff Sanoff, who's also a recording producer and an engineer. And he did some of the recording. He did pretty much all of the recording on the first Fake Names record. And then he provided invaluable sort of studio engineering assistance on, on, on this EP, which made it, um, which helped uh, to make it possible. But I had never, yeah, it's the first recording I've ever done where I've not, never been played this, any of the songs actually in person with anyone in the band. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't like optimal, but we're all like veteran musicians and we've all been on like a bunch of records. So that of course, that, that of course helps. And we've also, of those of us in the band, most of us have known each other for like 40 years or something like that. So that'll, that'll, that also helps. Our, our singer in Fake Names, Dennis Lixen is from Sweden and we've now known him for a number of years, but the rest of us actually grew up together, including Brendan Canty from Fugazi, who is our guest drummer on this EP, which is, of course, like really wonderful. Um, and of course, Brendan's the drummer writes a spring. Yeah. Uh, did you guys record it from your own houses or did you actually like go into a studio? I went into the studio that Jeff Sanoff, our friend, he he sort of runs um, Little Steven from um, Bruce Springsteen's band and cast member of The Sopranos. Um, Stephen Van Zant, he uh, owns a studio in Manhattan that Jeff kind of runs. So for my part, I, I went into the studio there. I know Brian Baker, one of the guitar players, went into Jeff's studio for a little bit. And I don't actually know where everyone else recorded their parts. <laughs> Brendan, Brendan recorded his parts at a studio in, in D.C., but I don't even know what studio. And um, yeah, so it's a little, a little jumbled, the process. Yeah, that's, I love hearing about like how people managed to still make records over the pandemic because for a while I've been trying to get into like recording music because my dad was big into it. Um, and hearing like people recording stuff from their own houses and like, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, you know, one thing I, I will say is that, uh, so I also play in this band called uh, Soul Side that was on Discord Records. We we broke up basically in 1989, and then we reformed 25 years later. And um, during the pandemic, we released a, a seven inch on Discord Records, setting the record for the longest time between releases for a disc for a Discord <laughs> band. I think it was 20 20. No, it was 30 years. I think it was 30 years between releases. But anyway. Soul side, we got into, and we are in the middle of like an, a crazy like songwriting groove with the pandemic. Our guitar player Scott McLeod, who's the singer of Girls Against Boys, but in Soul Side he's the guitar player, backup vocalist too. He lives in Austria, in Europe. Bobby Sullivan, the singer of Soul Side, lives in North Carolina, Asheville, and um, Alexis, the drummer, lives in L.A. and I live in Brooklyn. But we we've written in the in the past year like a full album which we're going to record um in in the fall but 
we got in so deep into the sort of virtual songwriting process that it's like we completely reinvented how we make how we make music um fake names is a little different just because we don't uh first of all it's only three songs and and also we were we're a younger band fake names is um but for Soulside, it's kind of amazing that these guys that were, we were making records together in the mid 1980s, now we're sort of almost as fertile in terms of music writing as, as we've been so many years later and in, in the middle of a pandemic. But it's like, we figured out how to work together and it's been an incredibly rewarding process and I'm super proud of the music we've been writing. So um, it's, it's, definitely, we, it's definitely weird but as I've discovered that, you know, there's there's ways to really try to make the most of it. And in fact, sometimes there can even be like happy accidents along the way um, that you would think might not be there when you're working virtually. Because one of the best things about playing music together in a room is the happy accidents that happen. And um, as we've discovered in Soulside, and um, it, it just that there's there's still lots of room for that to happen. So uh, you're the bassist in Girls Against Boys, and we've recently heard about a possible reunion next year. So would you like to touch on that at all? Yes. Um, so, and, and actually, technically, it's not a reunion because Girls Against Boys never actually broke up. So um, maybe reactivation is a better word or something like that. But um, we, it started a bit because touch and go records is doing a 25 year anniversary reissue of our album house of gvsb which is either our best record or our second best record i think probably we and most of our fans would agree that our albums venus luxure number one baby and house of gvsb are probably our two best records but anyway touch and go is doing a reissue and instead of just being one slab of vinyl, it's two slabs of vinyl because we're, there's gonna be a second record filled with B-sides and other sort of obscure songs, not throwaway songs. In fact, there's some, some of our favorite songs are on that second disc. Um, and so um, that, that we knew that Touch and Go was gonna be doing this and we were working on it. And so then we decided to put together some tour dates. So in February, I'm, I'm still not actually sure when the record itself is going to be released, hopefully in time for our tour dates. But in February 2022, we're doing dates on the West Coast, East Coast, and two Midwest shows, Milwaukee and Chicago, and in, in addition to New York, D.C., Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco, and L.A. Um, and also, we've also been writing some new song, Girls Against Boys songs. We don't have um any recording plans yet but we've got like a, a stack of uh really good songs we're working on as well so um so it's been a it, for me like girls against boys stopped being a full-time band in 2002 so it's almost 20 years but for me this past year has been my most musically active year since in in about 20 years and um that's been one of the things that's carried me through the pandemic. It's been wonderful, really great. I'm so lucky to be able to play with all these great musicians in both Soulside, GBSB, and, and Fake Names. I feel, I feel super lucky. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about on the podcast before how, like, especially over the pandemic and, and just in general, how music brings people together and how it was really like a healing item almost for some people during the time we were all kind of alone with, you know, nothing to do. So it was nice. Um, like Dominic said earlier, that we could still have mus like musicians producing music and letting records out during that time. Yeah, I, I agree, as, as not just as a musician, but as a listener. I, in a sense, my ears became fully unclogged as a listener during the pandemic. And I've been like just devouring music, not even like hundreds and hundreds of bands. I, I, it's like I go into one record, like the, when the Kariki record came out, um, you guys, you, you know, that record. Yeah. The, yeah. Ian McKay's, you know, current, current band with, um, Amy and, and, um, and, and Joe. And when that record came out, I just, I mean, I just listened to it dozens and dozens and dozens of times and I'm still listening to it a lot, but there's just been like maybe 10 or 15 albums that I've just dived in 
so deeply to and have just been so exhilarating and inspirational, both as a person, as a book publisher, as a as a parent, you know, and and you know, as a music as a musician, very much so. Um, so uh, on the other hand, I know this is both like because I know lots of writers, like because I'm a book publisher. I know lots of writers and musicians, and some musicians and some writers couldn't create at all. But while whereas others like it was this saving grace. So it's but but um, but yeah. Fortunately for me, I'm 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 in the category of having been you know everything in, in all my senses opened up um, more than they have been in a number of years. And um, yeah, the pandemic would have been so much more horrible had that not happened for me. Yeah, that Kariki record, I I saw Kariki in Baltimore, uh, like right before the pandemic and like got a picture with Ian. And then when that record was first coming out, we, we got it then. <laughs> there was this little box at the bottom and it was like, any requests? And I'm sure it was like packaging wise, but I was a little shithead and I was like, can Ian sign my record? And then it comes, it's ripped open, Ian signed it, and then there's a note in it, and it's like, congratulations, this is the first ever signed Kariki record. Wow. Uh, you know, that's so amazing. And, and I, I remember it back in the mid-1980s, um, you would order something, like I remember like ordering a Minor Threat t-shirt in like, you know, 86 or something like that. And this was before... I knew the people at Discord and stuff. And you would get it and there would be like a signed note from either Ian or from Jeff Nelson, you know, his partner in Discord and partner in Minor Threat. And it's so amazing that all these years later that it's that they that they still operate in that same way where they value per, per you know the personal not the personal touch because those words don't quite capture it. But that's why I love Discord so, I mean, it's not, it's one of the many reasons why I love Discord so much. And their principles and the way they do business is so incredibly sound and rock solid and has been consistent for all these years. There's very few other <laughs> businesses you could find that A, did business like that to begin with, but then are still doing it in such a punk rock, do it yourself kind of way. Like, yeah, any requests and then you fill it out and then like the top guy who's like a very famous rock star you know does does what you ask it's incredible it's so amazing i love i, lo I love hearing that yeah because the cool thing is like they're not like like you think of a record executive who's like all the way up here like they could very well be all the way up here like not make any time for you but still like we had we've had both Ian and Jeff on and they could have easily been like, no, we have other things to do, but they said, Hey, we're very busy right now, but yes. <laughs> and we had them on like, they're not, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it into words. Um, well, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll confess that when I got your invitation to, to appear here and you listed some of the people you had interviewed and included Ian, and um, Kim Coletta from Jawbox and, and her other endeavors. So because I didn't know you all, you know, I, I poked around a little bit, but you know, like our, our time, your, your time is valuable, my time is valuable. But I, since I didn't know it, I, I, sh I shot notes to both of them <laughs> saying, was this worth your while? You know, was, it, was this a positive experience? And, um, and Ian wrote back, they're, they're great kids, you'll, you'll love talking to them and Kim sim wrote, wrote a similar response back and um so so congratulations on making a positive impression on you know on people that have done millions of interviews yeah um but Ian is just so like like from the second that you say hello he's just very like okay we're friends now <laughs> like from the second that he joined he's that way like, with you I don't know if he's that way with everybody <laughs> <laughs> but like we we were talking to him for like 45 minutes we had only known him for 45 minutes and he goes hey when you when you get the chance want to visit the discord house and we were like yeah yeah <laughs> so now we're working on 
making that come to fruition. <laughs> you know, I think, I think he, like a lot of people and like a lot of musicians, like trusts his gut, you know, yeah. I, honestly, I don't think he just like, you know, opens his doors to just anyone who <laughs> he happens to talk to. And, but it's like, you know, like Ian has really good intuition so that spending a short time together, he just trusts his gut. Like this is a positive vibe. Um, and it is interesting. I don't know about the two of you, but my own intuition and even like I especially noted notice it as a as a book publisher of like which writers I, I I sign up and do books with. Like honestly, I don't want to publish books by assholes. I really don't. I don't even care if your book's gonna be a big bestseller. Like if you're an asshole, I don't wanna I don't wanna do your book. And so but you can it's hard to know what someone's really like, especially if they're talk if they want to get published and I'm the publisher, they're gonna be nice to me and try to tell me what I want to hear. And so you have to kind of trust your gut. And um, and some some people have better instincts than others, but I think that, you know, I feel like that's been become one of my strengths as a book publisher is just trusting my gut. And it's and it's it's worked out well like ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, like we've had interviews where like though the person was a, a pretty big musician. They were a douchebag. So yeah. we've said like, we're not going to post this. Oh yeah. 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 There, there, there've just been a couple of times where it's like, we don't want to represent that like under yeah. us, you know, and I'm sure it kind of goes the same way. Like you were saying, you don't want to publish a book for somebody that you don't really want to be in a relationship because of, you know, who they are. So. Yeah. And, and I think it's maybe it's similar with, with you all, because also for me, like if I publish this person, person and they're an asshole, and then they go out, I, and I'm their publisher, and they do something assholeish to someone, which is predictable because they're an asshole, then that reflects <laughs> poorly on us. So also like for you, for you two, like if you run this thing and this person's a jerk, like um, then that that taint, it like taints you a little bit, you know? And not not that I mean not that it would have like really obviously affected your. <laughs> podcast people that are watching aren't like oh I'm only going to watch when it's people that are super nice people but I do think it's like I don't really believe in karma because I'm not religious but I do a little bit believe that what goes around comes around and 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 that's you know that's like a discord principle you know and it's that was sort of my education as as both a musician but as a young person was coming out out of Washington DC and the values that I had which were largely based around social justice and anti-racism work and anti-homophobia, anti-sexism, um, but it was really incredible to have this, in, institution is not the right word for Discord Records, but this influential business and cultural force that, that helped for all of us in Washington, D.C. to reinforce our positive values and detract from our more selfish and capitalistic values. Yeah. Um... But in in nineteen eighty uh, sorry nineteen ninety seven you founded Akashic Books, so where did your interest for starting this company come from? So I my I had never ha been I never wanted to like be a book publisher that was never a goal of mine. Um, but what I wanted was to do a record label, and um, my band by that time I had been on bands on both Discord and Touch and Go which was the Chicago label that was very similar to Discord. Not completely similar, but similar community, family style, independent um, record label. And so I wanted to do my own record label. And um, then when in like 1996, Girls Against Boys signed a big record deal with a major label with Geffen Records we had been caught in a bidding war between all the big companies. We were sort of in the right place at the right time, like exactly the right number of years and months after Nirvana blew up because Nirvana exploded. Then all the labels were just trying to sign up bands like Nirvana. <laughs> and so we, and so we, we, we were offered like an obscene amount of money. Um, and we agonized over it because our hearts were with independent companies. Um, but, even even at the height of being when Girls Against Boys was very popular and still totally an independent band and we were filling clubs and touring and doing really well, we still couldn't afford health insurance. And and it's like you can't it's really hard, you know, it's like you, you're not you're not really even a member of the middle class if you don't have health insurance. 
And, and not that I, you know, not that my life is ruled by my class aspirations, but you want to be able to have health insurance. It's a screwed up thing in this country. And so anyway, we agonized over the decision, but it's like we all wanted to be able to, I'm, I'm not saying it was our decision was just about health insurance, but to me, that's a perfect symbol as, as to why we decided to like grab the bag of money and do a, and, and do a, a, a record with Geffen. So. For the first time in my life, I had disposable income. Not that I grew up poor, I didn't. I had a very comfortable upbringing, but I never had extra money in my pocket. It's just the truth. And so now I had extra money in my pocket, so I was finally able to start this record label I always wanted to do. And I started it with my DC musician, dear friends, brothers, um, Bobby Sullivan and Mark Sullivan. Bobby played in Soulside with me, and Mark was a very close friend. And so we started this together I quickly found, found it an uninspiring experience to be running a record label. At that time in the mid nineties, there were like a million little record label and thousands of them were doing good work. There wasn't a need for another record label. It was redundant with what was already there. And I was already, I was at that time playing in two bands. I was playing in Girls Against Boys and I was playing in a side project called New Wet Kojak that was also putting out records. So I was in two bands the music industry was beginning to collapse um, because of digital, you know, the, the whole digital music thing. And I, and I was like, wow, this, this is not, I've always wanted to do a record label, but this isn't that much fun. And on a whim, basically, we published a book. And that book got all this attention. And it was so interesting. And, and it turned out there weren't a million little book companies. There were like six. So there was a total need for more book publishers. And without knowing anything about book publishing, other than having read a lot of books in my life and knowing the music business a bit, without any background, I was able to like find really amazing books that were sitting there unpublished. They, there, you know, and in the music world, there weren't really great records not getting released. <laughs> the great records were getting released. So, book publishing ended up being exactly what I wanted out of a record label. It just happened to be books, and for me. Another advantage of books was, you know, I know music so well. When I hear a rock song, I hear the bass, I hear the drums, I hear the guitar, I hear the backup vocals, and I hear all the parts. And I, you know, sometimes I have to force myself to take a step back and really hear the whole thing. With, for me, at that time, books were not like that. Books were like magic. Like if you read a book and it's, something's really working, I didn't understand all the parts very well. So there was something kind of magical, and I don't mean that, again, I'm not religious, I don't mean that in some godlike kind of way, I just mean something really special was happening that I couldn't explain. So I had a little bit of creative distance from books that made them more exciting as well. Um, and then along the way, Bobby and Mark Sullivan, my two partners, they both had kids, and at this point, the company was just kind of sucking up our money, because we were getting it off the ground, and you know, it's really difficult to make any money from a record label or a book business. And so they didn't, they couldn't really afford to just keep, they needed that money for their like baby, you know, and um, I now have um, two kids, including a 14 year old. I'm actually in a house right now with six 14 year olds for my son's 14th birthday party. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, books just turned out to be super, I'm, I'm so happy that I like, wandered into becoming a book publisher because I, I, I love it. Um, but my core inspiration is like to be a DJ. And that's why I wanted to be a record label. Like I want to play the music, the records that make people dance. And if you run a record label or you want a book publishing company, you think you, you have good taste. That's what, that's why you run a record label or a book company. It's like, I have really good taste. I'm going to be able to identify stuff that other people maybe can't identify as well as I can, which is the same impulse of a DJ. Like I'm gonna play great records that are gonna make you dance. So to me, that's what being a book publisher is. It's sort of like being a DJ is, is kind of a little bit how I see it. Um, well, uh, speaking of Akashic Books, over the pandemic, you started doing quarantine Q and A's for Akashic Books. So how did this come about? That came about, um, I think, just with the rise of Zoom. Um, 
it was obviously a lot of people got the idea of doing interviews um but uh it was a way i think like an an alienation reduction mission <laughs> um and you know a way to connect with people and i what i wanted to do and it's what i've sort of stuck to my interviews have sort of slowed down a little bit after about a year um i'm gonna still keep doing them but i was doing it like i was doing one interview a week for most of the pandemic and then i slowed it down to one every other week and now it's just kind of random um but i i liked interviewing people who i know because um i want the i want my interviews largely to be humorous and so i want there to be a comfort level not that you can't have humor with someone you don't know but it's a safer bet when you know someone's sense of humor and um so I, I thought it was an interesting way to connect with people it was also an effort to just boost my book company's social media presence um and to draw in new you know new um followers you know and so I also, in addition to interviewing, I've interviewed mostly writers, but then I also started doing some musicians as well. And like I did an interview with Kathleen Hanna, which was just phenomenal. I don't, I don't know if you all have interviewed Kathleen Hanna, but she was- No, but she's on, she's on the list. Yeah, she's on the dream list. <laughs> yeah. She was delightful and funny as hell and, um, and passionate, you know, and, and sincere. And, um, and so, you know, and it was like, I think that there's some people that follow like Bikini Kill or Tease for Togo or Kathleen's other projects that are followers of Akashic, but there's a lot that aren't. So it was, you know, there was some there was some business strategy involved too, although it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a very ruthless <laughs> or focused strategy. But that was also, if I'm being honest, a look that was part of my motivation as well. Oh, and and, and the reason being in part because when during the heart of the pandemic, when bookstores were closed, it became like impossible to sell books. But we knew everybody in the pandemic was staring at their computer screens more than ever. And people were on social media more. So we knew we had to do more on our social media and we were brainstorming ways to do more. And what can we do more now that we're gonna have a few more people's attention? And that was an idea that grew out of it. And I, I particularly just like the funny interviews. Um, and I try to keep them super short. They're not deep dives like you all in your in your podcast, you have substantive conversations. And I'm not saying this is a criticism of mine, but my, my interviews aren't particularly substantive. I'm going more for sort of humor. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not trying to reveal something that's not been revealed before, unless it's the sense of humor of the person that people may not see as much there was yeah like there was one interview we we talked to keith morris uh not too long ago and that was like towards the end we were asking like the stupidest questions we were like uh when's the right time to eat a banana uh, -huh. uh and he was like this is what keith morris is like because he seems like a very just like when you first meet him, he comes across as like a don't fuck with me kind of yeah. guy. Like, you're here to ask me questions. I'm here to answer them. And then towards the end, we're like, what did you have for dinner last night? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think some of the best interviews are when it can just spiral out like that. Because, you know, of course, we start with a bit of a structure. And then he, he was like, oh, do you want to know anything else? He's like, do you want to know what my favorite color is? And we're like... <laughs> Tell us. And I, sure. He was like, he didn't <laughs> ask me what my favorite bird is. Uh, and then we, there was Bill Conway from the hard times, which of course that one's going to be funny. And then um, we end up like on famous birthdays, like on our phones. And he was like, well, I have the same birthday as this person. <laughs> so but those, there, are, I mean, those, I those are some of the best interviews. You know, you and you, the two of you have this advantage being young. Um, and I'm not, I hope I don't sound like teacherly in saying that, but in my interview series, I had my son, AB, the one who just turned 14. Like I had him do a few of the interviews. And first of all, like people watching just enjoyed them more. You know, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's more, it's more inter interesting to see like an enthusiastic, particularly young people but of course you have to be smart young smart and charismatic young people which obviously you two are 
Um, but also like Keith Morris might not be like, do you want to know my favorite color? Like he might not say that to the interviewer from Spin Magazine. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. but it actually it pushes, it helps to push the conversation into a, a, a less well-traveled direction, which is kind of what you want out of an interview. And it's great that you all are doing this. So yeah, cool. and I feel like we definitely used like little kid points just scoring these interviews. Yeah, I, we reach out to people and we're like, "We're 14 years yeah. old." No, and Kim, great. Kim Coletta was saying like, "Nothing against you guys, but I probably wouldn't have said yes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we have no shame in it. Like you said, I mean, we, we use that advantage because I mean, I, I think we have enough. You know, we have enough to back it up. So it's okay to say that, you know, and, and, it's, not a, and it's not a superficial advantage. It's real. And your right. perspectives are a younger, it, it's a hundred percent true. And in fact, it wouldn't be fair to not let the person know, you know, because they should know who's interviewing them. And, and, and that, that's just such an unusual attribute of an inter, of an interviewer. But I remember my son, AB, I've been taking him to the, my, I go every year to the Miami book fair, and, and to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, those are to me two of the best book festivals in the country. I myself am the, a co-founder of the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is also one of the best. But anyway, I go every year to Miami and to LA and I've started taking AB with me and he is the best bookseller. And I started when he was 12 and he said, honestly, like if me or anyone who, who works in my company were to sit at a booth at a book fair and try to sell people books, AB is better at it in everybody and he said to me like a year ago he's like you better take advantage of me now because i'm not going to be this cute for that much longer <laughs> oh yeah and whenever we go to shows like I, I went to see the interrupters a few years ago and it was it was packed we, we got there a little bit late and like people just made a path and i got like straight to the front like that's why you have kids <laughs> but um yeah and i feel like like yeah you kind of have to let people know because well this one time so doug carry on helps us get a lot of interviews oh, and cool. he reached out to uh porcel from youth of today and he was like hey you want to do an interview with a couple of hardcore kids he joins doesn't know that we're actually kids <laughs> <laughs> and he's like oh okay <laughs> it's true because because you can be a hardcore kid and be 50. You really can. Yeah. <laughs> I get young till I die. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, as you were talking about before, I, it's been said that Akashic is really dedicated to publishing specifically urban literary fiction and political nonfiction. But what would you say had drawn you in about these two genres? I like, I, I like, um, um, I like cities. I'm a city. I grew up in Washington, DC, and then I moved to Brooklyn and as like a rock and roller, like in bands, I've traveled all over the world playing music in cities, you know, not always cities, but usually cities. And I've also traveled a lot, like as a book publisher to places like, you know, like Kingston, Jamaica, Port of, uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad. And I just like the energy of cities. And a lot of the art that I like is made by people in cities. Just something about that, the chaos of cities is something that really, really appeals to me. And that's why the word like urban literary fiction, it doesn't really mean much, but, but there is something about the energy of cities yeah, that, that just has always appealed to me. Um, I like I like art that has explores sort of dark themes, um, and you know stories that maybe have un, that don't have happy endings. I'm not trying to like depress people at all. I want to be inspirational, you know. But the art that I you know like the music, the paintings, the dance, the literature, often is like really um, provocative not in like stripping naked and running down the street kind of way, but more in, you know, in, in, in tone and mood. Um, and so that's sort of one of the things that appealed to me as a book publisher. And then 
on the nonfiction level, you know, I'm left wing and I'm not ideological actually. And I, I, of all the books I've published, I do even have a few authors who are Republican, <laughs> but, but just a few among the many, many people that are either Democrats or further left than the Democrats, or they're not American, so they're not Democrats. But the point being, I'm really interested, as I mentioned earlier, in um, the fight for racial justice. My, my parents were engaged in that fight. Like my, my dad was a civil rights lawyer and actually worked alongside Martin Luther King a little bit. And, um, and because of my own experiences growing up, um, I w became aware on a firsthand basis of the impact of racial injustice, and racism. And so that's a key part of the Akashic Books mission. And uh, uh, we also, from our get-go, have been publishing a lot of gay, lesbian, transgender authors. I myself am a, you know, straight white guy, um, but but um, I uh, uh, I uh, just the fight for equality is so important. But I will say, and this is important, that we pick our books based on how good the books are and the like, the literary merit of the books. I'm not interested in publishing some novel that's like an anti-racist novel that's just like, this guy was racist and then bad things happened to him. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm interested in nuance. And so a lot of our books are not like didactic. They're not like necessarily banging you over the head. Some of the nonfiction books are about, you know, very specific topics. But the, on the fiction side of things, social justice runs through our books. But art is like is maybe even the most important, but we're not going to have art that preaches hate or, you know, sexism, etc. Um, so um, that's in a nutshell what what kind of m motivates me. We we publish a lot of black authors, uh, African-American authors, authors from the Caribbean, like a lot of Jamaican and Trinidadian authors, African authors, like the whole African diaspora is a cornerstone of our list. And I would say perhaps the strongest part of our list. Now, when I, on a related note, when I started publishing, to me, as I mentioned before, the music business was beginning to collapse and I had a lot of music in my life. I actually found publishing like to be an escape from music. So for the first 10 years of publishing, I published almost no books about music. Whereas these days, it's like I'm Ziggy Marley's publisher, I'm Les Claypool's publisher, you know, and so we publish a lot of musicians now. We did a book with Michael Stipe. We did a whole series of books with Prodigy, the rapper who, who's no, who, who passed away recently, but it was half of the band Mob Deep. And so across musical genres, we're now very active in music and we now do, do a lot of books by musicians, not like music, not criti music criticism. I actually don't really like music criticism that much, although I know I know some great music journalists. But um, we like to do books by the mu by the musicians themselves. And um, now we're also doing books by some athletes. And one of our writers just won a gold medal in the Olympics, which was incredibly exciting. So, oh, wow! Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 exciting to watch someone you know win a gold medal. <laughs> yeah. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for including me. I'm 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 honored to be a part of part of your podcast. And and I and uh, I didn't know what you all did when you invited me, and I know a lot more now because I've done my due diligence. Um, but um, but yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be included. So thank you so much. Chris, thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>